Hello, everyone. Hey, thanks for joining again. I'm pretty sure I alienated like 80 of the people that <laughs> watched last time because uh, I knew this would be story time, but I'm not sure anybody else realized how much of story time this would turn into. So thanks for joining me. Oh, Jesus. Sorry. Well, I was trying to adjust the PDF so that it was a little bit. Um, what is wrong with you, Adobe? God. When I use the free version of your product, I expect it to be perfect. Um, okay, so I read chapter one last time, which is just the history of Ethernet. Um, I looked around through the book a little bit more, and it looks like we're not going to get technical stuff for probably this chapter again. So we have another chapter of story time. <laughs> so um, if you're up for it, here we are. Um, we're talking IEEE. Hooray. It sounds like it would be technical, but it's again, it's once upon a time. So here we are. Welcome to Ethernet Storytime. Without further ado, chapter two. Oh, um, I will. We're reading this book, Ethernet, the Definitive Guide. Please don't sue me, O'Reilly. I love you. All right. Oh, okay. Ethernet is standardized by the Institute for Electrical and Electronics Engineers, or IEEE. Man, I had forgotten what that stood for. <laughs> um, it's in New York City. There's over 425,000 members in over 160 countries. It's one of the largest worldwide professional organizations, organizes conferences, blah, 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 blah. Okay, that's great. They also develop standards in a broad range of industries, so not just networking. We're talking IT in general, nanotechnology, which is something I didn't know, um, power generation products and services, telecommunications, all sorts of crap. So it's pretty cool. I always thought of them as just networking, but I also only learned about IEEE when I started my CCNA classes and nothing else. So here we are. Hey, Adrian. Damn, you're listening at 3 a.m.? Thank you. Let me let me read you to sleep if nothing else. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. The process of developing IEEE standards involves engineers from industry, government, and other domains who volunteer their time to work together within the IEEE SA framework to produce standards in order to develop a set of blah, 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 a set of specifications that participants agree will provide an open and interoperable standard that all vendors can use, the engineers are required to reach a consensus on the technical issues. The IEEE standards ensure that vendors can build equipment that works well together, thus expanding the marketplace and benefiting both manufacturers and consumers. Beautiful. A technological utopia. I love it. Okay, so talking about the evolution of Ethernet standard in particular, we had that first 10 megabit per second Ethernet standard that was published originally in like 19, yeah, 1980. Um, the Xerox Ethernet consortium. I love that word, consortium. Uh, using the first initial of each company's name, it became the Dix, ah, oh, yes, my favorite, the Dix Ethernet standard. Beautiful. I know it's probably DIX. <laughs> Um, okay, so it was called the Ethernet, a local area network, colon, data link layer and physical layer specifications. So that had the specifications for the operation of Ethernet, as well as that single media system based on a thick coaxial cable. Um, as is true for most standards, the DIX standard was revised to add technical changes, corrections, minor improvements, as you do with standards. And then they had a version 2.0 that was published at the end of 1982, so a couple years later. Um, around the same time that that standard was published, we had a new effort being led by, by the IEEE to develop open network standards. Um, consequently, the original Ethernet technology, which was based on the use of thick, they say a thick coaxial cable. And I assume the word thick is for more than just like descriptive purposes. Um, is there a difference between like, is there a regular coax cable and a thick coax cable? I don't know. Maybe we'll find out in this book or maybe someone knows and can tell me. Um, okay, so 
the original Ethernet technology that, that was based on the use of a thick coaxial cable to provide that shared communications channel ended up being standardized twice. So we had first by DIX and then second by IEEE. So interesting. Um, the IEEE standard is currently maintained by the IEEE 802 LAN MAN Standards Committee, Committee LMSC. Um, okay, I'm not going to read that paragraph under there because it's just talking about like, well, actually, no, yes, I am because it's interesting. I thought it was not going to be interesting. The first meeting of the IEEE, the Local Area Network Standards Committee, Project 802 was held in February of 1980. Oh, that's funny. Okay, the project number, which was number 802, was just the next number in the sequence being issued by the IEEE for standards projects. So they just go in order. I always kind of wondered about that, but how else would you do it, I guess? Um, there was originally only going to be one LAN standard with speeds ranging from 1 to 20 megabits per second, but it was later divided into the media or physical later layer, the PHI standard, and a media access control or MAC standard as well as a higher level interface standard. That's interesting, H-I-L-I. -I. I don't know if you say hilly, highly, I've never heard that before. The original access method was similar to that for ethernet and used a passive bus topology. All right. <laughs> Vampire tabs were used to chomp into thick coax. That's funny. <laughs> Hello, greetings, Argentina. Yes, this is a technical uh, bedtime story, really, at this point. Eventually, we're going to get into technical details, but right now we're learning about the history of Ethernet. So welcome. Thank you for joining. Um. <laughs> Thicknet, yes. <laughs> so last time we learned about Aloha, the Aloha network, and I was speculating about how cool it would be if, like, they never named it Ethernet, and instead they kept it as Aloha, <laughs> Aloha Net. It just sounds super chill, super chill and kickback. Imagine the like alternate universe we could have out there somewhere where it's still called Aloha. <laughs> so Aloha, and maybe we have another place where there's thick net. I love it. Okay. Um. All right. So. Passive bus topology. Look, I'm going to just say this on stream for the record. I do not understand what we're talking about when we say bus. I'm pretty sure I have looked it up before, but it's used in so much, so many different ways in terminology. I don't totally understand what, it, when we say we're using a bus topology, what does that mean? What is a bus when we're talking about physical hardware, ASICs and shit? I don't understand it. Um, no, I did not Google it before I did this stream, and I probably should have. So I'll look it up later, perhaps, or I'll just Google it while we're here tonight. Um, okay, so we use a passive, the original one um, used a passive bus topology. I guess that's not the case now. Uh, the IEEE 802.3 committee took up the network system described in the DIX standard and used it as the basis for the IEEE standard. The IEEE standard for Ethernet technology, I'm not going to read all of that, but it's I okay, IEEE 802.3 CSMA CD um, access method and physical layer specifications was first published in 1985. So we're in the mid 80s now. So it first comes about in 1980 and then fi only five years later, this is actually not very much time. Only five years later, um, we got the IEEE standard. So that's pretty cool. Um, so even though Xerox relinquished its trademark on the Ethernet name, the IEEE standard didn't originally use Ethernet in the title. That's interesting. So we're calling it just, okay, IEEE 802.3 CSMACD access method and physical layer specifications. That was the original Ethernet standard, but it didn't have Ethernet in the name. Um, that's because they say the open standards committees were very sensitive about using commercial names that might imply endorsement of a particular company. That is also interesting, but makes sense. As a result, the IEEE called this technology 802.3 CSMA CD or just 802.3. Okay. And still today it's 802.3. However, this today the standard has dropped the use of C, C oh, we have a typo here. CSMA CD, which is then changed to IEEE standard for ethernet much more elegant much smoother 
a better title. Um, the IEEE 802.3 standard is the official Ethernet standard. From time to time, you may hear of other Ethernet standards developed by various groups or vendor consortiums. Or you may hear of a different technology, such as 802.11 wireless LANs, referred to as Ethernet. They're referred to as Ethernet. Sorry, I hate that little box. There we go. Wireless LANs referred to as either interesting. I feel like I've definitely read that before and my brain just is not remembering it. I mean, I know of 802.11, don't get me wrong, but that being referred to as Ethernet, I'm not sure I knew that. Um, however, if the technology isn't specified within the IEEE 802.3 standard, then it's not officially Ethernet. That doesn't mean that the technology won't work but it will typically be vendor specific and not widely available from multiple vendors. It may also be a niche technology that was not considered useful enough to warrant inclusion in the standard. Oh, okay. Oh, I love this. They tell us how to pronounce 802.3 so, so that we don't embarrass ourselves, us new networking engineers. Okay, that's fine. That's cool. Thank you. You know what? I appreciate that. It is a good service to add a footnote with how, how to pronounce shit because sometimes it's not pronounced like you would think and then everyone laughs at you in the conference call. All right. The title of the most recent version of the IEEE standard as of this writing is IEEE standard for Ethernet. Yada, yada, yada. The 2012 edition of the standard contains 3,747 pages and can be downloaded for free from the IEEE. Maybe I'll just download that shit and uh, we can go on a little journey together through nearly 4,000 pages of the Ethernet standard. Actually, I might, I might do parts of that. Uh, yes, I'm going to actually load this. Oh, fuck. It went to a URL not found. They moved it. All right, I'll find it later. It's all good. Okay. Anyway. Okay, tell me about the bus. Microprocessors, this is Pelfrey saying, microprocessors have address slash data bus. Basically, each lane is a logical one or zero. With network communication, these standards are meant to set how things can communicate. Many vendors have their own standard and no good way to interoperate between vendors. Okay, interesting. Who supports FDDI? You crazy. Bus is a u universal term in IT. Okay, yeah, I feel like I see it everywhere and it's just like, what the fuck? I, I, what are we talking about? It sounds like a very general term, but also something I don't even know generally, so I should probably look it up. Yeah, you know what? Fuck it. Um, it's, I'm gonna divert to Wikipedia for just a moment. Or just Google. Uh, it's hilarious because when you type in what is a bus you know gotta gotta type it incorrectly or it just tells you what a bus is um, a bus network is a LAN topology in which each node aha thank you random website i'm gonna go to wikipedia And I share this. Give me just a second. You know what? No, I'm not going to. It's going to take me five minutes to just figure out how to get this window to work properly. I'm just going to read straight from Wikipedia and I'll put the Wikipedia article in the chat, I guess. I don't know if anyone's actually interested in like learning the definition of a bus network, but. Actually, is bus network the correct thing to be looking at? Fuck okay, it. We're learning anyway. Here we go. So there's your Wikipedia article if anyone gives a shit. All right. So a bus network is a network topology in which nodes are directly connected to a common half duplex link called a bus. And that link, aha, then we have another link to bus in parentheses, computing. That's actually what I think we wanted. In computer architecture, a bus, oh shit, this is actually pretty interesting. A bus, which is actually the shortened form of Omnibus, historically also called data highway, is a communication system that transfers data between components inside a computer. Well, okay. I mean, okay, we knew that, right? Like, I could guess that. Uh, yeah. Um, 
Okay, so it's a communication system, a communication system, very general term that that transfers data between components inside a computer or between computers. This expression covers all related hardware components, so wire, optical fiber, whatever, uh, and software, which includes communication protocols. So, okay, I wasn't wrong that it is an extremely general term. So I feel a little bit better about being confused about that. Um, Early computer buses were parallel electrical wires with multiple hardware connections, but the term is now used for any physical arrangement that provides the same logical function as a parallel electrical bus. Any physical arrangement that provides that. Okay. So the picture example they give is a PCI Express bus card slot. Um, so, okay, that counts as a bus. So it's any physical arrangement that provides the same logical function as a parallel electrical bus. Modern computer buses can use both parallel and bit serial connections and can be wired in either a multi-drop or daisy chain topology, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'm gonna stop reading uh, Wikipedia, but okay, that sheds some light on things. So that's that's pretty cool. Now that we know what a bus is, Back to this. All right, so Ethernet local area network operation is specified for selected speeds of operation from one megabit per second. Oh, Jesus. I don't think I'm going to read all this. Hang on. No, yes, I am. God damn it. Everything. All right, Ethernet LAN operation is specified for selected speeds of operation from one, this is from the Ethernet standard. Okay, so from, I guess, all right, if we were gonna read all 4,000 pages, we would get to this passage. Okay, speeds of operation from one megabit per second to 100 gigabits per second using a common MAC specification and management information base or MIB. Actually, do y'all say MIB? In my head, it's MIB, and I just realized like maybe people say MIB. But see, they're not telling us how to pronounce this. So, all right, the CSMA CD MAC protocol specifies shared medium, which means half duplex operation, as well as a full duplex operation. Speed specific media independent interfaces. I just recently learned what those are. And I really want to know do you say me? Do you say MII? See, I can't even say that. Do you say my? I don't know how we're supposed to pronounce it. So, the MIIs. See, that's not, that doesn't roll off the tongue very well. Um, Omnicore. What is Omnicore? Do I want to know what Omnicore is? It sounds like, um, I mean, I know core after something, like what that means, but what is Omni? Maybe I don't want to know. Um, I'm reading too fast. Why am I reading too fast? I'm reading as fast as my mouth can say it, which is slower than my brain can read it, which means... Okay, I'll read more slowly, more calmly. Um, okay, where did I look? Okay, so we specify half duplex operation and full duplex operation in the standard. Um, so speed specific MIIs allow use of selected PHI devices. <laughs> Another term, there's a bunch of terms that I'm learning lately that I'd like to be familiar with, among them PHI and MIIs. Um, Okay, so we have speed-specific media-independent interfaces that allow use of selected physical layer devices, or FIs, for operation over coaxial, twisted pair, or fiber optic cables. Okay, system considerations for multi-segment shared access networks describe the use of repeaters that are defined for operational speeds up to 1,000 megabits per second. Local area network operation is supported at all speeds, other specified capabilities include various PHI types for access networks, PHI is suitable for metropolitan area network applications, and the provision of power over selected twisted pair PHI types. Okay, so this is all just a big long description of what is in the standard, which makes sense because it is nearly 4,000 pages long, and uh, that's a lot of stuff I have in there. Hey, Andy. Hey. <laughs> See, I've got people fighting now. I've got Andy saying I got to be really 
And I've got someone else saying I'm reading too fast, but I'll just alternate, okay? Every paragraph, I'll either be angry or super calm. Nothing in between. <laughs> All right, here's something more interesting than reading the standard out loud. All right, either, blah, 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 Ethernet Media Standards. After the publication of the original IEEE 802.3 standard for thick, thick net, thick coaxial cable Ethernet, the next development in Ethernet media was the thin coaxial cable variety, inspired by technology first marketed by 3Com Corporation. When the IEEE 802.3 committee standardized the thin Ethernet technology, <laughs> oh, aka cheaper net, that's pretty funny. I like that. Um, they gave it the shorthand identifier of 10 base 2. Ah, that's where 10 base 2 comes from? Why? Okay, I guess they're going to explain that as I just read. But So thin Ethernet, aka cheaper net, aka 10 base 2. How am I going to remember that? All right. That's funny. I like cheaper net. We should call it cheaper net. Thick net turned into cheaper net. It almost rhymes with Ethernet, you know? Um, <laughs> uh, following the development of the thin coax variety of Ethernet came a steady stream of new media varieties over the years, including the unshielded twisted pair and fiber optic varieties for the 10 megabit, megabits per second system. Blah, 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 blah. I gotta practice reading out loud, it's been a while. Next, the 100 megabit per second fast Ethernet system was created, which also included several varieties of twisted pair and fiber optic media systems. Following the 100 megabit per second system came the one gig, 10 gig, and most recently 40 and 100 gig Ethernet media systems. I'm really curious why 40, because up till now we've been doing like tens, right? And now we're looking at 40 gig and then 100. Um, the media systems were all initially specified as supplements to the main IEEE Ethernet standard. All right. Cool. IEEE supplements now. I was just about to be like, I don't know really what a supplement means, but here we go. When the Ethernet standard needs to be changed to add a new media system or other capability, the IEEE develops a new the new standard as a supplement. The supplement, blah, blah, blah. I still can't, I can't say things with too many M's. I think that's my problem. The supplement may consist of one or more entirely new sections or clauses in IEEE speak, and may also contain changes to existing clauses in the standard. New supplements to the standard are first evaluated by engineering experts at various IEEE meetings. The supplements must then pass a balloting procedure before being voted into the full standard. Okay, so far still a history lesson, but also useful to know. Do we really have 400 gigabit and 800 gig as well? So I'm reading kind of an old book, huh? And it's okay. The foundation will still be there. No, that's cool. You know what? Well, who was it? Somebody recently had like a speed... It was some company. It might have been like, I don't remember. I don't want to say if I don't know who it was. I don't remember. But I remember like last year or a couple years ago or something, someone said that someone, some company, at least in te like a lab environment, they got one terabit per second of speed, which is pretty exciting. We'll be in the terabit soon, I'm sure. Mm. Okay, use 400 gig at work. So like for a backbone, I guess, huh? That's a dumb thing to say, as if I haven't actually like... I don't know, actually, did have I used 400 gig? How much you forget after a while? I've definitely seen like 40 gig, I've seen 100 gig. I think I've seen 200 gig as well on a backbone, but 400, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I've seen that. That's pretty cool though. It's it's a lot. It's fast. <laughs> this IEEE meetings must be fun, I bet. Yeah, I do kind of have in my head just like <laughs> I'm sorry if anybody's a member of the IEEE. I'm sure you're not watching my stream, but <laughs> I'm still sorry. It just sounds like a dusty old men like sitting in a room meeting. I hope they're a lot more fun than they sound. <laughs> um 
Yeah, okay, QSFP is quad SFP, which means four times 10 gig, which equals 40 gig. Absolutely. I'm happy to say I did know that. <laughs> I'm sorry, every day at 8.30, I have this alarm on and like, it's for something that I don't have to do at 8.30, but have to do eventually. And I, I really should just make it later because I never do it at 8.30. Um, Hey, DevNet Dan. Hell yeah. Welcome to the most boring stream that fucking exists. I'm, it's still, I'm sorry. We're not in the interesting part of Ethernet. I'm sad to say we're in chapter two. First chapter was like the history of all Ethernet. And now it's sort of like getting into the details of IEEE. So sort of interesting, but not, it's a bedtime story still. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. You know what? I really appreciate the encouragement to say fuck words. I'm waiting for YouTube to take down my videos. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, look. We have a little, um, we have our first figure table. Sorry. We have our first table in the book. Okay. New supplements are given a letter designation when they're created. Ah, that's where the letters come from. Once the supplement has completed the standardization process, it becomes part of the base standard and is no longer published as a separate supplementary document. Okay, Wi-Fi has like a fucking ton of those. It has a ton of stuff with letters. So does that just mean they haven't been standardized? Like, I don't know. They probably just, they just did describe the standardization process. It involves balloting. Okay. So all that Wi-Fi shit hasn't gone through it yet, I guess. Um, on the other hand, you'll sometimes see Ethernet equipment described with the letters of the supplement. Oh, well, I take it back now. On the other hand, you'll sometimes see Ethernet equipment described with the letters of the supplement in which it was first standardized. So 802.3U might be used as a reference to fast Ethernet. Okay. I mean, that, that works, right? Like instead of saying fast Ethernet, we just give it a fucking number and a letter and like made it, make it more gatekeepy than it already fucking is. Um, look at our pretty table supplements. It's a lot of supplements. We have 10 base two. So this was our first supplement to make it thin, cheaper net, which they didn't put in here, but I will remember this thin Ethernet, 10 base two, cheaper net, all the same thing. All right, then we get repeater specifications. I don't know what FOIRL is, but okay, fiber, fiber optic something, 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 I'm sure. 10 base T twisted pair. Then we get our fiber optic thing. Then we got fast Ethernet and auto negotiation at this point. Okay. Then our full duplex standard in 1997. 100 base X. So that was gig Ethernet in 1998. Uh, gig base T in 1999 over so that was over twisted pair then we get a frame size extension okay for a vlan tag link aggregation in 2000 10 gigabit per second ethernet in 2002 i mean if you think about it it's like we didn't go that long ever without leaving it alone i found a typo 1988 was not when cheaper net happened pretty sure that was like what 1982 or something i don't know welcome new follower thank you i don't know if you're watching now but thanks um all right so just going down the line we got 10 gigs we got poe we got uh okay short range coax cable then we get Okay, 10 gig over twisted pair. Then we get, okay, we were expanding our frames again for all tagging. 10 gig over long range fiber optic in 2007. Then we get energy efficient ethernet, which I know nothing about. Just learned about it as I was reading those words. And lastly, we got our 40 gig and our 100 gig. And I'm sure um, this table is not up to date. Actually, I'm gonna look at it now. Uh, I'm gonna Google it because I'm sure we have what? Something for, um, 400 gig. So at least, so let's see, 802.3 supplements list. Hopefully we'll get me something. Supplements list. Here it is. All right. So what our last one here is the 40 and a hundred gig in 2010. So since then, 
Hmm. We had something in 2009 updating the Ethernet TLVs. Okay. That were already specified in 802. It says specified in 802.1 AB to 802.3. Okay, so we're okay. We're updating type length values. Um, in 2011, they added priority based flow control. So we're at 2011 802.3 BD. And then um, 2011. I still don't think this one is even up to date probably, but the last one in this list that I found says in 2011, we had 802.3 BF as well, which was a provision of accurate indication of transmission and reception initiation times of some packets to support IEEE. And I don't know what this is like off the top of my head, but IEEE P802.1 AS. Maybe someone knows what that is. I'll look it up, whatever. what this is. You know, two don't want a s. What are you? You know, I thought I could just find the answer real easily. Somebody know it. We need more folks in networking. It's true. We do. We need more women in networking. <clears throat> Okay, you know what? If I don't find it in the next five minutes, I'll look it up later. Well, I found the draft. Local and metropolitan area networks, timing and synchronization for time sensitive applications. That is apparently the title. So, all right, cool. So that was in 2011. And let me just do one more pass over for um, the most, a more recent one because that. There have to have been changes since 2011. I mean, that's the span of 10 years. Um, let me say. God damn it. You look up 802.3 supplements list, and instead of getting a nice, easy supplements list, you get a lot of random ass websites saying, what is 802.3? All right, let's try this again. One one more pass over. I'll see if I can find like. Let's just find it in Wikipedia. Eh, good old Wikipedia. Fuck me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So fuck. This is a huge list. All right. So in twenty eleven. Priority based flow control, an amendment by the IEEE, blah, 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 to develop an amendment to add a MAC control frame to support 802.1 QBB. So that's priority based flow control. Then we had MIB definitions for Ethernet. Okay, boring. I don't know how to describe that. Provide an accurate indication of the transmission and reception initiation times of certain packets. All right, that's the one that's on. No, it's not even on this list. Christ, this is an old book. I should have gotten an updated version. I kind of just assumed it would be updated, but that was my mistake. Um, all right, in 2016, I'm just going to... No, sorry. 2015. This is an interesting one. No, 2014. <laughs> Here's Okay, 2014, we defined a four-lane 100 gig per second backplane 5 for operation over links consistent with copper traces, such and such and such lengths up to at least one meter and four lane, 100 gig bits five for operation over links consistent with copper twin axial cables up to five meters. So that's 2014. In 2013, no, that one's boring. In 2015, we had the 100 gig, 40 gig ethernet for optical fiber standard, um, or rather supplement. Then in 2016, we got 100,000 base T1, so gigabit Ethernet over a single twisted pair for automotive and industrial environments. So different. Um, 2016, we also got 25 gigabase slash T40 gigabase T, so or Gbase T Ethernet for port four pair balanced twisted pair cabling with two connectors over 30 meter distances. I'm stumbling over the words because there's a lot here and I'm sorry. Um, we have express traffic. Then in 2017, we got our 200 gigs 
over single mode fiber and 400 gigs over optical physical media. I'm sorry, I'm not going to read this whole list because it is huge. I'm just trying to pick out the most interesting ones. Um, we got third generation PoE in 2018. Um, let's see. I don't know what, okay. Plastic optical fiber. I don't know what that is, but we got a supplement for gig ethernet over that in 2017. Um, more stuff for automotive things. What's another interesting one? Damn, 2017 through 2020 were some popping years for Ethernet. Um, yeah, okay. And then here we go. This is TBD, but 100, 200, and 400 gigabit Ethernet using 100 gigabit lanes scheduled for fall 2021. It is past fall 2021, so I'm assuming that didn't happen, but we'll see. Um, in 2020, in 2020, January of, 20, of last year, right before COVID decided to fuck us all over. We got 400 gigabit over multi-mode fiber for four and eight pairs up to hundred meters. Uh, do, do, do. It's another interesting power over ethernet for over two pairs in 2020, that same month and year. Um, let's see, this is interesting. So now we're getting into TBDs. A lot of other like little things. Okay, we got, in, so TBD, another interesting one. 400 gig over DWDM systems, TBD. That'll be 802.3CW. Um, PTP timestamping, I don't care right now. Get greater than 10 gig, nope. Automotive, automotive. Let's see. Single pair, single balance pair, multi-drop segments. 100 gig, 200 gig, and 400 gig operation over optical fiber using 100 gig signaling. Um, power over data lines, time synchronization over point to point single pair Ethernet. And yeah, here we go. The last one, the best one possibly. Still TBD. This is 802.3 DF, and it's in Wikipedia, so I can assume, I hope, that this is up to date. 200 gig, 400 gig, 800 gig, and 1.6 terabits using 200 gigabit lanes, also using 8 slash 1600 gigabit lanes for 800 and 1600 gigabits per second. Beautiful. So fast. All right. That was a really long foray into the fucking supplements, and I'm sorry, but it is interesting, like, what's coming up, you know? Uh, we got quite a few. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's like 10 or 11 like TBDs in the supplements list on Wikipedia. So that's pretty fun. Um, all right. Plastic optical fiber, by the way, is an optical fiber that's made out of polymer. It is robust under bending and stretching. All right. Today I learned. Cool. Back to this. The years of formal acceptance of each supplement into the standard are shown. Yada, yada, yada. Okay, that's fine. Out of date. Um, hang on. What did I miss? Draft standards. If you've been using Ethernet for a while, you may recall times when a new variety of Ethernet equipment was being sold while the standard was still in draft form. I do not because I have zero experience um, with hardware involving that kind of thing, but um, sure. Before the supplement described, the new variety had been entirely completed or voted on, okay? This illustrates a common problem. Innovation in, in the computer field, I love that they call it the computer field, and especially in computer networking, frequently outpaces the more deliberate and slow-paced process of developing and publishing standards. We gotta have those standards though. It can't be the Wild West. Vendors are eager to create and market new products, and it's up to you, the customer, to make sure that a product you're considering will work properly in your network system. One way you can do that is to insist on complete information from the vendor as to what version of the standard the product complies with. It may not be a bad thing if the product is built to a draft version of a new supplement. Draft versions of the supplements can be substantially complete, yet still take months to be voted on by the various standards committees. Sounds like the U.S. government. When buying pre-standard equipment built to a draft of the specification, you need to ensure that the draft in question is sufficiently well along in the standards process that no major changes will be made. 
makes sense. Otherwise, you could be left out in the cold with network equipment that won't interoperate with newer devices built according to the final published standard. One solution to this problem is to get a written guarantee from the vendor that the equipment you purchase will be upgraded to meet the final published form of the standard. Note that the IEEE forbids vendors to claim or advertise that a product is compliant with an unapproved draft. Okay, sounds pretty good to me. I don't know. Basically, like, purchase pre... What, what do they call it again? Hang on. Okay. Was there a term or did I just, like, totally make that up? Pre-draft? A draft version. Okay, so buy draft versions... At your own danger, I guess. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the DIX standard versus IEEE. Was that a Silicon Valley episode or are you just joking? <laughs> oh man. Yeah, Wi Fi AC. I thought I thought I had seen something about what was it, 802.11 AC or something still being in draft, but that was. Yeah, I actually don't remember. I could I could have it was only like three years ago, so could have been out of date. <laughs> yeah, don't look don't look at your don't take a don't unplug a fiber optic and just don't look at it. I think they can yeah, they can still fuck up your eyeball. <laughs> don't do that. Um vendors don't often adhere to the standard. Interoperability can be a pain. Okay. Yeah. Do vendors really not implement standards properly very often? I kind of assumed that like they might be liable in some form or fashion if they're not, but it does sound like the, I mean, how they're describing it here, the onus is on the customer somehow. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, okay, here we go. Yeah, all right, we got somebody familiar with the DIX standard in here. Um, okay, when the IEEE developed 802 from the original 802.3 from the original DIX standard, it made some changes in the specifications. One reason for this was that the two groups had different goals. The specifications for the DIX Ethernet standard were developed by the three companies involved and were intended to describe the Ethernet system and only the Ethernet system. At the time that the multi vendor DIX consortium was developing the first Ethernet standard, there was no open land market, nor was there any other vendor, multi-vendor land standard in existence. Hmm. The efforts aimed at creating a worldwide system of open standards had only just begun. The IEEE, on the other hand, was developing a set of standards intended to integrate into the world of international land standards. Consequently, the IEEE made several technical changes required for inclusion in the worldwide standardization effort. The goal was to standardize network technologies under one umbrella, coordinated with the International Organization for Standardization, or ISO, ISO. The IEEE specifications did permit backward, compa blah, backward compatibility with early Ethernet systems built according to the original DIX specifications. This is of historical interest only. All Ethernet equipment built since 1985 is based on 802.3, the IEEE standard. All right, cool. Oh no, are we gonna learn about the, if we're gonna learn about the OSI, uh, the OSI model, I might just completely skip that over. But if we have people new to networking, I, I won't, who wanna hear about it. Um, but for me, that's like old, old news. Anyway, okay, the IEEE standards are organized according to the OSI reference model. This model was developed in 1978, blah, blah, blah. Geneva, Switzerland, the ISO developed the OSI <laughs> reference model to provide a common organizational scheme for network standardization efforts, with perhaps an additional goal of keeping us all confused <laughs> with reversed acronyms. Yes, <laughs> it's true. What follows is a quick and necessarily incomplete introduction to the subject of network models. Oh no. All right, quick vote. I'm going to give it like, I'm going to give it just a little bit of time. Who wants to actually learn about OSI model today or can I skip it? I won't be upset if you don't want me to skip it. However, 
if I don't hear anyone say they explicitly really want to learn about OSI, then I will skip it. Oh, look at you. Hey, Tim. Cisco intended to develop a solution and then the IEEE would ratify a standard later, sometimes based on the Cisco version, but often they went their own way. Mm. EIGRP. And Cisco would end up supporting both until the standard was more widespread, at which point the Cisco version usually quietly disappeared or was deprecated in favor of the standard. I can think of a few. Cisco had their own version of STP uh, and what, I think EIGRP was proprietary um, for a while before it became a standard. Um, yeah. Yikes. Using STP between vendors. Yeah, I've seen some fun stuff with STP misbehaving between vendors. Oh man. The stuff that Cisco switches will default send versus like, you know, if you've got like Cisco switches at one layer and then you've got Arista or somebody else at another layer, the Arista switches don't necessarily recognize the STP frames being sent up from the Cisco switches. So even if you don't intend to be like really using STP, uh, it'll still fuck up your network sometimes because Arista is just like, I don't know what this is. Here you go, next switch. And then it passes on the, uh, the STP PDU and then it's just like a big clusterfuck. It's been fun. Many people believe there are only seven layers in the OSI model, <laughs> but research has identified at least 11 in the wild. Please tell us about this. I'd like to know the other four. <laughs> Skip layer seven, please. <laughs> Interesting. So ISIS became a standard for ISPs because OSPF hadn't been ratified yet. That That's interesting. Did not know that. Huh. An OSI refresher just in case. Oh no. Oh no. All right, we'll do it. We'll do the, OSI. you know what? I'm, I committed to this book. I'll go through the book. PBST and MST don't mix well. Yeah, absolutely. That's where I've seen problems. Interesting. Yeah, if you want some inspiration for women in networking, check out Radia Perlman, who she literally created STP. Um, Brenna Mead slash international networks at Indiana University, SC21 WAN design. And Susan Hicks from Oak Ridge National Lab. You work with her? Badass. Man. Yeah, there are some really awesome women in networking. Um, I There's there's so much I could say. I'm going to get on a tangent, so I won't talk about it at the moment. Um, but have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> um, uh oh. Uh oh. Are we going to fight about what's better, RSIS or OSPF? Oh man. All right. Let me get through OSI <laughs> before we start fighting about protocols. Um, all right. The seven layers of OSI, that seven layer bean dip. Yum. The OSI reference model is a method of describing how the interlocking sets of networking hardware and software can be organized to work together in the networking world. In effect, the OSI model provides a way to arbitrarily divide the task of specifying network behavior into separate chunks, which are then subjected to the formal process of standardization. It's important to remember that the OSI is a model for describing network functions and not an architecture or blueprint for network design. <laughs> I don't know how that would even work, even if you tried to use it as a blueprint for a network design. But anyway, the OSI reference model describes seven layers of networking functions. Okay, and of course, true, true to form, much like Cisco Press, we have a figure that we're referencing with words before we see the figure. The lower layers cover the standards that describe how a LAN system moves bits around. The higher layers deal with the more abstract notions like reliability of data transmission and how data is represented to the user. The layers of interest for Ethernet are the lowest two layers, layer one and layer two of the OSI model. Da, 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 da. Here we go. So physical data link network transport session presentation application. So we're concerned with these two when we're talking about Ethernet, data link and physical. Um, okay, so this is the OSI model. Lots and lots of different, uh, you know, 
phrases. What's the what's the term for, you know, it's an acronym you're trying to remember. It's not an acronym. You're trying to remember a series of like, you know, these layers and there are different little sayings that you can use to remember it. Um, I heard the funniest one last night, but I'm not going to say it live because it's, I, I, oh man, I'll just, I'll just find it and retweet it again. <laughs> it was not, it was a uh, certified curls. I think she came up with it. Fucking funny. Anyway, in brief, the OSI reference model includes the following seven layers, starting at the bottom and working our way to the topmost layer. Physical layer standardizes the electrical, mechanical, and functional control of data circuits that connect to physical media. That's the physical layer, layer one. Data link layer or layer two. It establishes the communication from station to station connected to the same network system. This is the layer that transmits and receives frames and recognizes link addresses, so MAC addresses. Uh, the parts of the Ethernet standard that describe the frame format and MAC protocol belong to this layer. All right, and then we got layer three. So those first two, those are those are what have to do with Ethernet or Ethernet has to do with them, whatever. That's what we're concerned about here. But then we get layer three, network layer, which establishes communication from station to station across an internetwork. This is ancient language, I love it, which is composed of a number of interconnected network systems. This layer provides a level of independence from the lower two layers by establishing higher level functions and procedures for exchanging data between computers across multiple networks. Standards at this layer of the model describe portions of the high level network protocols that are carried in the data field of the ethernet frame. Uh, okay, protocols at and above this layer of the OSI model are independent of the ethernet standard. Yeah, okay, so uh, above, above layer two, we don't, ethernet doesn't care. Um, Okay, transport layers, layer four, reliable end-to-end -end error recovery mechanisms and flow control, higher level networking software. Layer five is session, provides mechanisms for establishing reliable communications between cooperating applications running on separate computers. Presentation layer, provides mechanisms for dealing with data representation and applications. So JPEG, <laughs> that's what I always think when we're talking about presentation, but it's not just JPEG, you know media file formats is what I think of, I guess, with presentation layer. Application layer, applications, layer seven, provides mechanisms to support end user applications. So email, browsers, etc. Oh boy. Oh boy. IEEE sublayers within the OSI model. The Ethernet standard concerns itself with elements described in layer two, aka the data link layer, and layer one, the physical layer. Uh, for that reason, you'll sometimes hear Ethernet referred to as a link layer standard. To help organize the details of developing specifications for Ethernet, the IEEE defines extra sublayers that fit into the lower two layers of the OSI model. Yeah. Which simply means that the IEEE standard includes some more finely grained layering than the OSI model. While at first glance, these extra layers might seem to be outside of the OSI reference model, the OSI model is not meant to dictate the structure of network standards or the design of network products. Instead, the OSI model is an organi organizational and explanatory tool. Sublayers can be added to help deal with the complexity of a given standard. Yeah, okay, but Cisco makes us memorize it in a very specific way, so. Uh, okay, so another figure that we can't see at the moment depicts the lower two layers of the OSI reference model and shows how several of the IEEE specific sublayers are organized. Let's just peek at it real quick. Yeah, okay. So we've got, these are the two that you typically, I think, will learn about with CCNA, divided up into the LLC, the logical link control, and the media access control sublayers. Okay. Um, within the major sublayers shown, there are further sublayers defined for additional MAC functions, new physical signaling standards, and so on. At the OSI data link level, there are IEEE logical link control and media access control sublayers, which are the same for all varieties and speeds of ether Ethernet. 
the LLC layer is an IEEE defined mechanism for identifying the data carried in an Ethernet frame. The MAC layer defines the protocols used. So hang on, I'm going to repeat that because my brain just skipped over it and it's been a while since CCNA. The LLC layer is an IEEE defined mechanism for identifying the data carried in an Ethernet frame. The MAC layer defines the protocols used to arbitrate access to the Ethernet system. What a fucking weirdly worded sentence. Defines the protocols used to arbitrate access to the Ethernet system. Both of these sublayers are described in chapter three. Okay, so we'll get into more detail there later. Okay, so physical signaling sublayers and media specifications are extra little Ethernet specific um, parts of the data link layer. Actually, wait, I'm sorry, hang on. Actually, these are two, okay, so now I understand. I did not even look and see these arrows. This makes a lot more sense. Whoops. Um, okay, so this is indicating kind of badly that the data link layer is, is divided up into these two, the LLC and the MAC, and then the physical layer is divided into physical signaling sublayers and some media specifications. Duh, okay. All right. Hmm. Why are we talking about pizza? Okay. At the OSI physical layer or layer one, you find IEEE sublayers that are specific to the media speed of Ethernet that's being standardized. Each of these sublayers is used to help organize the Ethernet specifications around the function functions that must be achieved. Sorry, I'm just, each of these sublayers is used to help organize the Ethernet specifications around the functions that must be achieved to make a specific media variety of Ethernet work. Okay. Understanding these sublayers also helps us understand the scope of the standards involved. For example, the MAC portion of the IEEE standard is above the lower layer media specifications. As such, the MAC standards are functionally independent of the various physical layer media specifications. Okay, so get get out of here, box at the bottom. All right, so we have, all right, the MAC portion of the IEEE standard. So in data link layer up here, this is the MAC portion, okay? It is quote unquote above in the model, it's above, these like layer one specification, you know, little attributes, whatever. Um, as such, the MAC standards are functionally independent of those physical media specifications, meaning that the MAC sublayer doesn't change no matter which physical media variety may be in use. So we're in different layers, so we're independent of each other, I guess, is the point of that strangely worded paragraph. Um, the IEEE LLC standard is independent of the 802.3 Ethernet LAN standard and doesn't vary no matter which LAN system is used. The LLC control fields are intended for use in any LAN system. Ah, okay. Actually, hang on, what am I reading? No matter which, yeah. Okay, so LLC is independent of Ethernet. It's not just Ethernet that has LLC. So as I've indicated here, the MAC sublayer is actually Ethernet dependent, and so are these bottom two as well. LLC is always there regardless of whether or not you're using Ethernet. So um, this is why the LLC sublayer is not formally part of the IEEE 802.3 system specifications. Okay. All of the IEEE sublayers below the LLC sublayer are specific to the individual LAN technology in question, which in this case is Ethernet. To help make this clearer, the Ethernet specific portions of the standard in figure 2.2 are shaded. Okay, yeah, so that's what I just went over. Below the MAC sublayer, we get into the portions of the standard that are organized in the physical layer of the OSI reference model. The physical layer standards differ depending on the Ethernet media variety in use and on whether we're describing the original 10 megabit per second Ethernet system, 100 meg per second fast Ethernet, or 1000 megabit gigabit Ethernet. 10 gig, 40, 100, blah, blah. 
These sublayers are described in more detail in part two. If you can tell, we're in part one, so it'll be a while. Levels of compliance. In developing a technical standard, the IEEE includes only those items whose behavior must be carefully specified to ensure that the system functions correctly. Okay. Um, therefore, all Ethernet interfaces must fully comply with the MAC protocol specifications in the standard to perform their functions identically. Otherwise, the network would not work correctly. Okay. Some tiny pieces are falling together for me. Um, <laughs> I missed the first 18 pages. Do you mind starting over? I'm very sorry, but this ride has started and it ain't stopping for anybody. Not even me. Um, at the same time, the IEEE makes an effort not to constrain the market by standardizing such things as the appearance of an Ethernet interface or how many connectors it should have on it. The intent is to provide just enough engineering specifications to make the system work reliably and interoperate correctly without inhibiting competition and the inventiveness of the marketplace. Capitalism. Uh, in general, the IEEE has been quite successful in this goal. Cool. Good guy, IEEE. Um, let's see. Vendor innovation can sometimes lead to the development of devices that are not described in the IEEE standard and that are not included in the media specifications in the standard. Some of these devices may work well, but they typically won't interoperate with other vendors' equipment because they don't follow the standards. All right, the effect of standards compliance. How much you should be concerned about all this is largely up to you in your particular circumstances. Another way of saying this is a blah, blah, blah. Another way of saying this is optimality. What a word. Optimality differs according to context. They say everything in like the hardest way possible. It's great. It's up to you to decide how important device and media system interoperability may be given your particular circumstances or context. I like how they, I like how they give us like, okay, that's what con it means. Context. This means con this is what context means. For one thing, not all innovations are bad. After all, the twisted pair Ethernet media system started life as a vendor innovation that later became a carefully specified media system in the IEEE standard. However, if your goal is maximum predictability and stability for your network, given a variety of vendor equipment and traffic loads, then one way to help achieve the goal is by using only equipment that is described in the standard. I think that's fair. One way to decide how important these issues are is to look at the scope and type of network system in question. For an Ethernet that just connects a couple of computers in your house, you may feel that any equipment you can find that helps make this happen at the lowest cost possible is a good deal. If the equipment isn't described in the official standards, you may not care at all that much. Oh, you may not care all that much. In this instance, you are building a small network system and you probably don't intend for the network to grow very large. The limited scope of your network makes it easier to decide that you aren't all that worried about multi-vendor interoperability. On the other hand, if you're a network manager of a campus network system, other people using your network will be depending on the network to get their work done. The expanded scope changes your context quite a bit. Campus and enterprise networks always seem to be growing, which makes extending networks to accommodate growth a major priority for you. In addition, network stability under all sorts of traffic loads becomes another important issue. In this very different context, the issues of multi-vendor interoperability and compliance with the standard become much more important. Beautiful. Let me just see what we're looking at here. All right, here's where we get into some interesting stuff. Slightly more interesting than the history lesson we've gotten so far. However, it has been a little over an hour and I've been trying to keep these videos contained a bit. So I think I may actually end right before IEEE media system identifiers. Um, because that, yeah, this is a good place to stop actually, um, functionally. So that's the story of Ethernet so far. Hooray. I hope everyone has been enjoying this. 10 base T over barbed wire. <laughs> Let's just try to run it on anything. <laughs> New meeting to vampire tap. 
Barbed wire is twisted pear. You may even say it's shielded. <laughs> hmm. I have to think about that one. What about like more barbed wire wrapped in more barbed wire? That's shielded, right? Uh. <laughs> IP over avian carriers, also a good one. RFC 1149, the classic. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, guys. This has been a great refresher for me on, I guess, the OSI model, but also um, some little things that they drop into CCNA studies that you don't really think that hard about until later. Um, so this has been both a good refresher and some learning for me. So I hope it's been good for you or you're asleep soundly in your bed very peacefully after having listened to the most boring stream ever. Um, I am streaming right now. I'm scheduled to stream every Monday and every Thursday from 8 to 10 p.m. U.S. Central Time. Uh, I know this is difficult for some people uh, based on, you know, your time zone where you are in the world. So I'll switch it up every once in a while. Or, you know, if I just decide I want to take over my entire life with streaming, I might add another stream or two, maybe with something different. I'm not sure. Um, at different times on different days, maybe like a weekend stream or something. But Mondays and Thursdays, 8 to 10 p.m. Central. I'll be around. You can find me on Twitter. I am Tracker on Twitter as well. And uh, this video will be recorded to YouTube uh, at some point. It will be uploaded to YouTube rather um, in the near future. I already have my um, the previous one uploaded, the history of Ethernet. Um, I have that one uploaded on my channel. I am also Track It Pacer on YouTube. So if you just, I guess, it's like Track It Pacer study sessions, I think is you can search that. You should be able to find me. Um, and I have like three videos up so far, but I'll be adding them as I keep doing Twitch streams. So anyway, thanks for joining me. I will um, see you later. I hope I catch you on Monday or Thursday or whatever.